All right. Thank you, Ben, for having us and um, giving us the opportunity to give this maybe a little bit of an unusual talk in, in that we have this two-part talk that uh, illustrates the work that we do separately, but also the work that uh, Erin and I have been doing together for the past uh, few years. So I start us off um, in telling you about um, how we might use cognitive training to promote learning across the lifespan. So in my lab, we ask questions like, how does learning and cognition change across the lifespan? And uh, very importantly, so do people learn differently? And if they learn differently, um, why do they learn differently? And what is the role of the environment, the education, or our intellectual engagement? And um, how does that play a role on learning and brain development? And what are some of the experiences and strategies that we can teach people uh, that helps them learn? And what can we do, just generally speaking, to improve learning? So these are some of the questions that we're addressing in my lab using a multitude of methods and perspectives and I'm going to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what we do in the next um, couple of minutes. So first off, so we know that cognition, our mental abilities, our cognitive skills, they change across the lifespan, as I was just saying. And one thing to know about how, cognitions, uh, how cognition changes across the lifespan, not all cognitive functions change the same way. So we know that skills like vocabulary and general knowledge, they continue to improve as we get older, up until the very old age. And then other skills, what we call globally as so-called fluid skills or processing skills, processing speed, or what we call working memory, show a trajectory that looks a little bit like an inverted U-shaped curve that improves up until our 20s or the mid 20s, where we typically show the best performance in our lives and then typically goes downhill from there, sadly so. But again, there are other cognitive functions that continue to improve as we um, get older. So what we're particularly interested in my lab is to know about the development and the individual differences in working memory. So here in red and in yellow. And why, why, why are we so interested in working memory? So uh, working memory is um, a very crucial cognitive skills that is at the intersection between perception. So everything that we hear, everything that we see enters a working memory store that allows us to keep information active and on hold for a brief period of time. And it's only a limited amount of information that we can keep in mind in order for us to do other more complex skills such as math. It lets us uh, to read, uh, comprehend what we read. It, it just generally it helps us with language skills. It also helps us with reasoning skills. And so in general, it's really crucial to have good working memory um, skills to do complex uh, cognitive functions. And therefore it might not be super surprising that it's one of these uh, good predictors or the best predictors in how well we do in school. Um, in addition, it's also often compromised by a host of different factors. So if you imagine yourself when you're stressed, your working memory is most likely not performing at its best. And therefore, it also impacts the other skills that relies on the functioning of, uh, of working memory. Uh, and uh, even more so, it's also critically impaired in many developmental or clinical disorders such as ADHD or major depression, and as I was showing you before, with the trajectory across um, the lifespan, it's also one of these crucial skills that is susceptible to the effects um, of age. So typically we show worse uh, working memory performance as we age. The interesting part again about working memory is that there are huge individual differences in how well we are able to keep information in mind uh, over this brief period and how well we are um, able to resist distractions, which is uh, uh, also a hallmark of working memory. So at any point in time across the lifespan, um, some people are really um, good or show good working memory capacity and others show worse work working memory capacity and also the trajectories across the lifespan can look very differently. So although these um, red and yellow curves that I'm showing you here, they represent uh, the, the averages of thousands of participants. But when we look at the individual level, so some of them I plotted here, um, again, there are large individual differences of how that um, can look like for an individual person. So the question is, where do these individual differences come from? 
and these individual differences can also arise uh, through a host of different factors. So often mentioned biology, genetic variation, definitely plays a big role in how well our working memory develops across the lifespan. But there's also other what we call modifiable health factors, such as diet, physical exercise, sleep, uh, substance abuse, uh, or substance use more generally, that also affects um, how working memory develops. There's mental health, emotional state that I mentioned before. So stress, for example, can affect um, how um, uh, working memory um, uh, can express itself, but also attitude and motivation. So, so more personality related factors. So um, how well we think of ourselves, of uh, performing in, in certain environments, uh, attributions that you make on the interpretation of events that we have. And then also education, culture and experience also seems to affect um, how our cognition develops. And then last but not least, this is really one of the key things that uh, we will be talking about today, because that's uh, what we really focus on, is the role of cognitive or intellectual engagement here through uh, video games or, or cognitive interventions, working memory interventions that also plays a role. Um, so in recent years, so the last 15, 20 years or so, people have started to come up with interventions to promote working memory skills, precisely because um, the idea is that if we improve working memory skills, or if you find a way to improve working memory skills, it might also help you to do better in a host of um, these higher cognitive skills, reasoning, language, because working memory is underlying the functioning of these um, higher cognitive skills. So again, if we, we have ways to improve these fundamental working memory skills, that can be beneficial for uh, a range of other cognitive factors. And we talk about transfer effects there. And well, I'll get to that in a second. So training, um, training or working memory training or cognitive training or more colloquially brain training has only pro uh, proliferate, uh, prol proliferated in the past 15, 20 years or so. So what I'm showing you here are the number of publications uh, that have focused on working memory training, cognitive training, or brain training more broadly, from only very few publications in the early 2000s to over 600 uh, only in the, in the last year. Um, so there's an upward trajectory in, in how many people are publishing work um, that uses uh, cognitive intervention work or working memory uh, work. And there's even more in the public media, and Erin will talk about this as well, um, that, that has really led to some excitement about um, the, the potential benefits of working memory training or cognitive training again. But at the same time, as some of you might know, the field is also highly contentious and controversial. So several studies have demonstrated improvements in various cognitive functions as a result of working memory training, but there are also some others that didn't find any benefits. And what we have done a couple of years ago, my graduate student, uh, Jackie Au, and now postdoc and I, and some others, we have conducted what is called a meta-analysis so a summary, a quantitative summary of um, everything that has been published up to a certain point. So in, in that year, it was uh, 2015, but then we also did a more recent one last year in which we collected um, uh, working memory studies um, that have been conducted in young ad adults. And we were interested in a so-called transfer effect. So what, I was show what I'm showing you here are um, examples of non-trained um, variants of a, um, or, or non-trained uh, outcomes, so a fluid reasoning uh, task, so a problem-solving task, a, a little example on the right, where your task as a subject is to figure out um, the, what um, pattern would fit in this empty slot. And uh, what we were able to demonstrate is that when people train on a specific um, a set of uh, working memory training, uh, an NBAC training, and Erin might uh, talk to you more about this. Uh, what we could show is people who trained on NBAC for a certain um, period of time, they improved in this um, fluid reasoning skills after training more so than the control group that is shown on the left in red. And this difference between the improvement in blue of people who trained on working memory versus those that didn't tr train on working memory is about a quarter of a standard deviation. So what I'm showing you here is, is an effect size. 
And if you would want to translate that into a standardized uh, IQ score, is about um, the equivalent of three to four points on an IQ scale, which you might think is not all that big, but it's in young adults. And um, so very similar what I did show you earlier about the trajectory. So young adults typically are performing at their peak. So they're performing very well in these fluid reasoning skills. So improving just a little bit, just these three, four points can actually be very significant. So where are some of these contentious or controversies coming from? So there are a host of agreements and disagreements about the status of, of working memory training or, or brain training. But generally, there's still agreement among most or many of us, and uh, which is that specific working memory skills are malleable. So that means if we train on working memory, we typically see improvement in the trained task. So we're getting better off what we're training on. This might not be super um, <laughs> impressive. So if you go running, you get better at running. So it's, it's, it's pretty much explaining it that way. But also there seem to be improvements in similar non-trained tasks, so called near transfer tasks. So for example, if I train on a variant of working memory, I train with um, auditory um, stimuli. So I, I keep uh, letters in mind and, and keep an increasing numbers of letter in mind. If I then get tested on visual material, I also show improvement in visual material. But what the, where there's disagreement is, um, is in the area called FAR transfer. So FAR transfer are uh, uh, outcome measures that are decidedly different from the training task that we have been uh, training on. So for example, in these matrix reasoning tasks, problem solving tasks that I've shown you before, those are typically very different from the training task itself. So this would be an example for FAR transfer. So where are some of these disagreements uh, coming from? So what are the reasons? So the reason are that um, typically there are small effects. So what I was showing you before, so these are considered small effect sizes. And then often there, the effects are also inconsistent. So some people do find effects, some people don't find effects, and it's not entirely clear what the reasons are for, for these discrepancies. There are also often questions about underlying mechanisms. So, um, so it's not entirely clear why these transfer effects should occur in the first place. So what is being transferred and what is being learned? Um, other questions focus on, on methodology. So there's often issues with small sample sizes or um, there's some, some other issues that have to do with uh, data quality. But overall, um, I think most of us will, will agree that there's some evidence for for transfer uh, for transfer effects, even though the effect sizes are small. And that's really what, what becomes interesting to me as a scientist is to figure out um, what, where is the signal coming from and what can we learn from equally from those who don't find any effects from, and from those who do find effects and where are these differences coming from and what can we do with them in order to improve um, future interventions. So let me show you a few examples of where some of these discrepancies could come from. So one big issue is what we call individual differences. So I was showing me before, there are large individual differences in, in how well we learn across the lifespan, but also when you look at, across an intervention. So what I'm showing you here on the x-axis are, are people who trained on uh, about 20 training sessions on a working memory task. And each of these curves and this spaghetti plot represents one older adult who has undergone some of these trainings. And on the y-axis is just the performance level. So this is the, the levels that they get to at uh, each uh, particular day. And as you can see here, if you see that the yellow curve, overall, the curves are maybe a little bit hard to see, but the yellow curve on the bottom shows uh, one participant who struggled throughout the training. So they started at a very low level and hardly were able to improve throughout training. And as opposed to the green curve um, that shows this huge trajectory also starting at a relatively lower level, but this person figured out how to learn and benefit from the training and shows this massive improvement from the beginning from the training to the end. So the question is, if we then compare people who improve a lot during training and those people who don't improve at all, should we expect similar um, amounts of trans for transfer for effect or broad learning so, or in other words, if someone doesn't improve in the training at all, why would you expect any outcome measures uh, uh, to improve too? 
So again, maybe the analogy, if you um, run, if you train on a treadmill, if you just continue to walk all the time and you don't improve, would you also expect any improvements in, in climbing stairs or, uh, or biking if you just continue to, to leisurely walk instead of really putting um, effort into it or really getting better at, at your training? So this is precisely what we tested in, in kids. So we looked at the amount of uh, transfer. So how much do people improve in a non-trained uh, matrix reasoning measure? So problem uh, solving task as a function of improving a lot. So that's shown in the, the green curve. So these are kids that showed um, a large amount of improvement during training. And on the left, where we hardly see anyone, uh, anything, are the kids that don't improve at all. And in the middle are the kids that trained on a non-working memory intervention. So here demonstrating that it really matters how much you improve during training in order to benefit um, from, uh, to really benefit from the training. And taking it a step further, so this is work um, that Anya Pahor, the postdoc who has been working with me and Aaron for the past several years, is really the driving factors. So here we're trying to, to get more at these underlying uh, mechanisms of transfer. So again, we are interested in seeing whether we're training, uh, and then we also had a, a control group, whether we see improvements in these matrix reasoning, problem solving um, um, uh, tasks as a function of a uh, working memory training. And uh, even though we, we see small um, effects that the training group improves more than, than the control group, what was really interesting or of interest for you in this, for us in this studies was the amount of learning in a near transfer measure. So non-trained version of the training task where we could now use both the experimental group and the control group. So the amount of learning in this near transfer measure was then predictive how far or how much people improved in matrix reasoning, providing evidence again, that it matters how much you learn in the training task itself. Um, and whether or not you show for transfer measures, uh, for transfer effects in these matrix reasoning measures. So this is about individual differences, how far, how much people improve in the training um, itself. And that's really related to the subject, to the participant themselves. But we know that there are also training related features. So training that have to do with the intervention that also seem to um, matter. So I'm showing you a few things here. So one is a training dose. So that's very much related to how much you improve in training. Another question that we ask here, so how long do you have to train? So what I'm showing you here on the left is a study with older adults. And again, the improvement in a non-trained um, or a several non-trained versions of um, uh, visual spatial abilities or matrix reasoning measures. And what I can show you here is the more or the longer you train. So if you train 10 days or 20 days, the more you train, the more improvement you show in these transfer measures. And the same is also true in young adults. So here too, the longer you train, if you train four weeks or three weeks or two weeks, it really matters. Again, there are, uh, there's evidence for those response effects. The longer you train, not surprisingly, uh, again, the more you benefit from training. And then another thing that I wanted to point out and really then transition to some of Erin's work is another factor that we found to be very critical is apart from just how much you improve in training or how long you train, it's also participant engagement. So how engaged and how much effort do people uh, put into their training? And what we could show here is the more engaged participants say, say that they are, the more they also improve in training. So the critical question is, how can we get people to engage with the training task that they can also benefit uh, from training? And with that, I go to the interim summary here. So I gave you a little glimpse of uh, and, and hope to, to provide you with some evidence that targeted training, so on working memory, can lead to generalizing effects in various populations. I showed you some older adults, some kids, um, but also uh, young adults. And uh, very important that there are individual differences and training related features that affect training outcomes. So the ones that I showed you here is how long you train and how well you train. And the amount of learning, how much you benefit from, from learning also mediates the extent to which participants show far transfer. And here, getting back to the question that I just asked before. So the question is really how we can maximize participant engagement for everyone that they can really experience benefits. 
And with that, I'm handing it over to um, Aaron. And I thank you in the meantime for your attention. So let me stop sharing. Great, thank you very much. Um, my name's Aaron Seitz. I'm a professor of psychology at UC Riverside. Um, I also direct the UC Riverside Brain Game Center for Mental Fitness and Wellbeing. Um, and just kind of a little bit about um, this group, what we've been kind of working on is um, kind of principal research to design, test, disseminate evidence-based research approaches to understand and train brain fitness. And the real goal is like, what types of things will benefit real life activities? And um, today I'm gonna to be talking about working memory, but we look at a number of issues ranging from hearing, vision, executive function, language skills, motion regulation, ultimately, you know, happiness and well-being. And the idea really is that, you know, these are all kind of brain processes that in principle are trainable. The hard part is how to do it. And, you know, this gets, you know, taking a step back is um, some of the concepts and excitement about brain training is that, you know, these images, you know, you see brains running on treadmills or lifting weights and it kind of back to like, you know, as we started to learn about muscle physiology and the cardiovascular system, you know, this knowledge actually helped us come up with exercise routines that made it so athletes are able to run faster, further, jump higher, um, and kind of be more competitive in physical sports than historically was um, true earlier um, in the 20th century. And so the concept is that like, as we learn all this stuff about neuroscience and psychology, can we apply the same knowledge to basically make it so that we could do brain training approaches um, that would strengthen our brains? And right now we have um, companies um, like new ones popping up, it seems like every few weeks that, um, you know, make pretty big promises in terms of you use the programs and that maybe you'll be able to focus better, remember things more, provide, you know, do better in your classes, better in the workplace, um, address, you know, cognitive declines as you age, um, et cetera, and so on. And there's been a lot of discussion of do these things work? And a few years back, um, there is a consensus statement that came from Stanford Institute for Longevity and Max Planck Institute for Human Development um, that came up with, you know, a kind of dampening statement that, you know, claimed, especially this is really focused on the extent to which these types of trainings can reduce cognitive decline. And, you know, what I show in blue is that, you know, they conclude there's no sci compelling scientific evidence to date. And then skipping to the bottom is that we encourage continued careful research and validation in this field. And so the way to interpret this type of statement is that it's not actually a statement of whether this type of intervention can be beneficial or not. It's really that the products that are out there are going past our understanding. And that what's really necessary is research to kind of understand what are the approaches that might be beneficial and what are the approaches that might not be. Um, and one of the big issues, and this is something that kind of Susan brought up, you know, before is kind of the specificity of memory training. And so the idea is, you know, are you teaching to the test or are you giving rise to training that is going to give rise to positive outcomes that will affect your other activities? And so this end back example that Susan promised that I would describe, you know, is one where, it's a task where you see a series of screens. And so basically each time you see a plus, that's kind of another screen you see. And in this, um, is appearing at different spots on the different presentations. And your task in this case is to indicate when the target is the same location you saw two items ago. So the first screen, you haven't seen anything, so there's no match. The second one, there's no match. The third one, oh, look, it's the bottom right corner. That's the same place I saw two items ago, that's a match. Next one, no, that's not matching two items back. Next one, no. Um, upper middle, yes, the same I saw two items ago. Great, it's a match. And so you can start with the two back. Um, at first, it's complicated, and then you get better at it. And then you can move to the three back. Uh, 
three back. So now you just remember what you saw three hours ago. With training, you could get better at that. You move to the four back, et cetera, and so on. So actually here's some data from Susan's lab where this is college students that are trained across 20 days. And you see that on average in this study, they're getting to like the five or six back. It's kind of crazy. Like we've had some people who've gotten to like the 15 back. So you see this series of items like, oh, I saw that 15 items ago. It's kind of impressive. And so it's clear that there's learning on this task. You then go to the grocery store, try to remember what it's supposed to get. Do you remember? So this is really the big question is like, does this transfer to the real world activities that you care about? And this is the place, as Susan said, where the evidence is really mixed in the field. And so she presented these meta-analyses where you kind of look across all these different studies and you try to take their evidence together and try to come up with some conclusion of what's consistent. And recently we tried to do a different type of approach to meta-analysis. And so here's like one of the most complicated figures you're ever gonna see. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through what this means. So, you have the circle where essentially each of these radii is describing a different study. And so across this, we have like 52 different studies that did this end back training. And that each of the circumferences are basically describing a different feature of those training studies. And so if we look at the first six of them, there are attributes of the training task. And so you see on the left, like some of them are just training a single task, some of them have two tasks at the same time, some of them are games, some of them are spatial, some visual, some audio spatial, et cetera, and so on. Some give you feedback. Sometimes they're kind of slow, others are fast. Uh, sometimes you train for a long time, sometimes it's a short time. Sometimes you have to do really well to get to a harder level, sometimes not so well. So essentially, you know, what you see with all these different colors is all the different ways that people have trained the NBAC, that when they do meta-analyses, they treat them all as the same. And then what you find um, in the... And so what we see is a couple of them are different types of working memory tasks. So some are updating like your ability to take in a new piece of information and forget an old one. Some of them are the number of things you could remember at once. Um, there's different domains of working memory. So some things are verbal, some things are visual. And then the outer two are fluid intelligence. So like, um, you know, there's different ways that you could basically test for the spar transfer. And the key thing is that you start going around this and you basically find that is pretty much like only seven studies across all of these. It really did the same thing. And then we started looking at the outcome measures. There's about 30 different types of working memory tests that they looked at transfer for. And there's actually about 30 different types of fluid intelligence tests that they looked for transfer for. And so like every study like does different methods. Um, and this is a really big problem for these meta-analyses because are we possibly comparing apples and oranges? Um, you know, is it possible that some of these training approaches really are having big effects that are real and others just do nothing and that we don't really know how to combine them? And then also with the outcome measures, which of these outcome measures are actually reliable and predict something that might be related to how you'd use memory in the real world? Um, which ones are reliable in terms of how fluid intelligence might predict something about your ability to do well at school or the workplace or other settings. And so the thing which is kind of frustrating is that the science is not there. So we have a good understanding of which approaches might be beneficial and which ones not. And so one of the things we've been looking at is, you know, what are the different principles that might be um, at play that would lead to a working memory training that would be beneficial. And so we've identified some features like the diversity of stimuli. So, you know, if you only train on like these blue squares that appear in different parts of the screen, should that transfer to all uses of memory in the world that including ones that don't involve spatially presented blue squares? Or maybe if you train across different aspects of memory, 
um, and you know, different senses that this might transfer more. Same thing if you break working memory down to different tasks. So we have updating, your ability to bring new things into your memory and forget old things. Or capacity, the number of things you can remember at once. Resolution, how well you can remember everything. Association, can you make connections between stimuli? Maybe these dimensions of working memory need to each be trained if you want to be able to transfer to real world situations. There's aspects of motivation. So like if you gamify something and provide feedback and incentives, when will that help and will, will, when that not? I mean, the interesting thing about um, the meta-analysis that um, Jackie Ah and Susan did is they actually found that sometimes if you pay people more, they actually learn less. Um, so, you know, not all motivational frameworks are actually going to promote learning outcomes. One thing I'll come up in a moment is like, how do you design things so that, you know, if you're doing this end back task, when can you make it so it's really going to be a good learning experience and when not? Um, personalization, how do you make it so that this actually meets the individual needs of the user? Um, and then, as I said before, like, you know, if we really want to evaluate these things well, we need to have measures that baseline an outcome that are valid predictors of real world performance and individual differences. And just to give you kind of a piece of this, you know, I want to kind of bring up the importance of design because you could have two studies that use very similar tasks in their description that, you know, might give rise to different outcomes. And so um, I realized once again, you know, I'm actually presenting Susan works, not my own. Um, and this is work she did with um, Ben Katz, um, where basically this came from studies that they did in children where they tried to make it so that these and back tasks were really appealing. And so what you see here on the left is that it's the same spatial and back I showed you before, but this frog is appearing on different lily pads and the task is supposed to remember, um, you know, the see, you know, whether it's on the same lily pad and items back. It could also be cats and different windows of a haunted house you know, monkeys on different sails of a ship. And so, you know, this is supposed to make the game more fun. And then if you do well, then you could basically get gold coins that you could then um, convert to prizes afterward. You get certificates and you make it more fun and enticing to the kids. And so the question is, you add in these motivational features, does it lead to better learning outcomes? And um, this is kind of one of the many figures in the paper, but basically what they find is that kind of unintuitively, that if you put all the motivational features together or compare it to when they had none of the motivational features, they learn more when you basically cut out all these pieces. And so that, you know, there's less learning when you basically have things that are supposed to motivate better learning. And in fact, when they took these things out one at a time, um, each time they took one out, it also led to performance gains. And so like, it doesn't say that like motivating people to learn impairs the learning process, but like, what if these things are distracting? So imagine you're doing this task and that you get something right, you get a gold coin, it's like, oh, what sticker do I want? Do I want a ladybug or a butterfly? And like, it pulls you out of the training experience as a distraction. And that um, maybe you don't learn because you're not paying attention to the training task at that point. I mean, there's, so there's lots of ex explanations in terms of why just creating something that kind of looks like a game, you know, might not actually give rise to a better learning experience. And so one of the things that we've been working on at the Brain Game Center is like, can we make something where it's gamified so that it motivates you to perform well on the task? but really pulls your attention towards the learning objectives. And so we've been looking at um, kind of, you know, some of these are space themed. We have one for older adults where, you know, you're bee pollinating flowers. We're looking at multiple tasks. So like um, some are looking at the end back task, some are looking at the span task. Um, and, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions about these later on, but um, the real key thing is to basically make it so it's a more interactive game but at the same time, make it so that maybe it doesn't pull you out of the learning experience. And in terms of some of our early results, 
we'll be looking at is what we call the non-game, where basically you're just, in this case, it's not a spatial task. It's just you see a series of colored circles and you have to um, respond to the circle that matches what you saw and I does back. And then what we could do is look at the skin game. So this is similar to what that cat study I showed you a few slides ago, where you, know, you see a series of pictures. So basically your same color matching task is now imposed on you know, a colorful platform, but you don't control the character. Um, and our hypothesis is that, that this basically gives rise to something that looks more enticing, but that most of the things you see on the screen are actually distracting from your ability to recognize these colors. And then we have the full game, where basically in the full game, you're moving a character that is actually collecting the items. And what we find, this is preliminary results. Um, we're still trying to increase our end to see how consistent this may or may not be. Um, is that if we look at the full game, you know, actually there we look, seem to be getting, you know, slightly more learning than um, the non-game. But definitely the skin where you basically just have like your picture show that kind of looks a little bit enticing, it replicates the cat study. So basically it does worse than the non-game. And so the key idea here is that it's not whether you gamify things or not. It's not whether you put in motivational features or not. It's how you do it in such a way to pull people's attention so that it's focused on the learning objectives. And that gives reinforcement that reinforces those learning objectives. And then I think it's pretty hard to get it right. And if you get it wrong, then maybe it negatively impacts the learning outcomes. So that's kind of an argument in terms of how you train people is important and it differs across studies. The other thing is like, well, do everybody gain from the same approach that you might think is better? And so like starting off, this is a study that Susan and I are um, doing right now funded by the NIH is like, you know, are games really best for everyone? And like, you know, one perspective, I mean, I see this comment, especially with kind of older adults is like, games can be really distracting and overwhelming. So like, you know, this idea that you have all these different things going on at the same time, for some people, that's just kind of horrible and it makes it harder to focus on the things you're supposed to learn from. For other people, it might actually be beneficial in terms of they're able to um, be motivated by this more enriching experience. And what we think that might explain this is individual differences in how you're able to manage distractions. So those who are able to manage distractions well, maybe they gain from the game. Those who are, are not able to handle distractions well, maybe the game actually hurts the learning process. And this brings us to a national memory training study that Susan and I are running, where our goal is actually to run 30,000 people in working memory training. And the reason we want to run this large study, and once again, this is a study funded by the National Institute of Health, um, is that our hypothesis is that not everybody is going to have the same propensity of working memory training. Not all working memory training approaches are gonna have the same effects. And so instead of asking this question, does working memory training work? Can we instead ask what types of working memory training will result in what aspects of transfer and for whom? And what's really important about asking this question differently is that it recognizes the fact that, you know, maybe some people will learn more from the game. Other people will learn more from the non-game. Other people, maybe neither of them are going to help. And then also, like, maybe some people, all they care about is near transfer, that, like, they're not happy with their working memory. And so improving the working memory really is meaningful to them. Other people, maybe they're really interested in the extent to which it might transfer to fluid intelligence. And that really embracing these individual differences and individual needs and trying to come up with more personalized approaches is, I think, the way that this field can move forward. But it's going to require a lot of participation and a lot of data to be able to work through this complexity. And so just some discussion here is that, 
you know, I, I do believe working memory training has great potential as an intervention to improve memory. Uh, but it's key to realize that not all working memory approaches are the same. It's really hard to know how to compare them in some cases. Not all people are the same. And so you have to be really careful when you're observing that there's either a positive effect or a negative effect in one group of people. What does it tell you about another group of people that might be different? And that going back to the consensus statement, we do need more research. And hopefully you could move to a point where we know which people are good candidates for working memory training. And also kind of for a given person, what training might work best for them. And you could help us out. So here's a QR code. You could participate in our study. Um, and this will help the science and help it get us to a point where we might be able to say more concretely, you know, what types of approaches are going to be best for which people. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, great talk. I mean, just one second here. Here we go. Fantastic talk. That's really cool. Um, and so I think what, if, what we can do is just go ahead and jump straight into the um, questions. Screen disappeared again. Zoom, Zoom has been letting me down tonight very bad. <laughs> I don't know what the issue is. There we go. All right, so let's jump into the questions. Um, so this will be kind of for, for both of you. Um, so Susan, it starts with you first. Um, so one of, the, one of the viewers wanted to know, this is more in the, the application side of things. So what do you think um, like K-12 teachers would be able to realistically do um, given the opportunity cost of substituting content area instruction for working memory training? Yeah, so this is a super important question, right? So the, the question is really, so if you want to teach math, right, and you have a limited time to teach kids math, your best strategy for the kids to do better in math is to teach them the exact math skills that they need to know. So that is still the most e efficient way to go. That said, there are other ways, and this is work that we're also doing together, Erin and I, where you could support kids in giving them uh, interventions or app that they can play as their homework or in their free time using tablets or, or their phones, where they can um, improve, some, uh, improve some of these um, crucial working memory skills that can help them support their learning in math as well. And we have done some studies um, with my collaborators and I in, in uh, Zhejiang University in China, where we have specifically compared um, a kids uh, learning in, um, so these are preschool kids and kindergarten kids mm -hmm. um, that have been training on these working memory um, uh, training games uh, in, in an extracurricular uh, environment. Mm -hmm. And we were able to show that kids who struggled in working memory and, and struggled also in, in math learning and, and in literacy. So um, giving them these means to train on working memory was um, allowing them to catch up to their typically developing peers uh, later on so that they underwent this four-week uh, intervention in uh, training about 10 minutes a day on working memory um, after school, and they were able to catch up to their peers. So we're not in a, in a situation where, where we can easily implement this working memory uh, training in the classroom. It's a little complicated. So you really need, well, first of all, there's time constraint, as the teacher was saying. There's only so much you can do. But there's still other means where you can uh, support kids um, at home. You can do other things. You can have them uh, play board games with their families, with their siblings, that are also known to support working memory skills. So they don't necessarily have to be on their phone and play on their apps to, to um, support or improve working memory skills. So it's just one a, a tiny puzzle piece or a contribution that can help to support their learning more broadly. Okay, that's a great answer. And it's a good question too. Um, mm -hmm. 
So you, you I think you, you kind of touched on this with the with the huge study that you that you're trying to work on now, um, but maybe you can expand on it a little bit. How many subjects would be needed to start to effectively evaluate whether the small effects are real or not? So you kind of talked about how like some people see it, some people don't. You know what? What? How? How would you, in your opinion, how would you start to actually pick out like, okay, this is a real effect, this one's not. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I'll punt that to Aaron there because you, you touched on this too in your um, presentation and, and mm -hmm. that might also um, be easier yeah, for exactly. people to then and make think, the connection. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And I think the key question is how do you think about a small effect? Because it typically pushes the question to um, when you average things across a population, um, what do you end up with? As opposed to you look at an individual who potentially gets a gain. And so like um, one way of thinking about this is that if you run enough people, um, any small effect on average, you know, it's gonna start becoming significant. Sure. But what if it was the case that, um, you know, three out of 10 people would have profound effects and the other seven would have nothing. Mm -hmm. But let's go more extreme. You know, what if it was three out of a hundred people would have profound effects and the rest of the people would have nothing. You basically do a large scale study um, and you're gonna have a tiny effect size because basically um, the majority of people who aren't getting a benefit are gonna overwhelm your ability to see the people who did. But if you then were able to identify in advance the three people who had a profound effect, and then basically find other people who had the same propensities. Mm -hmm. Then you end up with a big effect size. Right. And what we don't know right now is exactly what's going on. Is that you know, our you know, th this is why this large study you know with thirty thousand people seems like a giant number. But um, the reason we need this large number is that we want to get past the point where we're focusing everything on population averages. Mm -hmm. And instead, we're basically trying to kind of identify, you know, what percentage of people are good candidates. Um, and then, you know, as I said, like, also it gets to the question of, like, effect size relates to an outcome. And not everybody is searching for the same outcome. So that the effect size for the near transfer, like, you know, can you do another end back well? Those are giant effect sizes in almost all these studies. Mm -hmm. And that... Um, for some groups of people, that actually might be something that is really beneficial. And so the personalization, um, I, I really think, is everything in this line of research. And I think that when it comes down to it, it's just like personalized medicine, okay. where, you know, what medicine is moving towards is like, how do we find the approaches that are going to be beneficial to the individual patients, as opposed to why do we treat, you know, a hundred people for something where only one of those people is going to get a game. Sure. Okay. That's, that's an interest. Uh, that's not something I had really thought about, but that's a good point. I mean, if, if it's, if it's really going to be like medicine, you, you have to treat it like medicine. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, so this would, this goes back to, I think Aaron in your talk on slide 12, um, where you showed you had the, the diagram of all the different training methods. Um, and sort of just, you know, discussing how, you know, you have all these studies and everybody does, you know, in theory, it's, this, it's trying to test the same thing, but it's done slightly differently. And so you can't really compare them. Is there a realistic way to start narrowing down those training methods and, and actually compare them to each other? Or is it just something where you, you kind of talked about like, you know, okay, we can focus on different parts. Is, is that going to be the best way to do it? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And I think that what is necessary, and this is true with kind of interventions in general, mm -hmm. is that there's a tendency, whether you're a scientist or a care provider, is that you come up with a thing that you think is going to change the world. Mm -hmm. And so you test your thing versus something that you're pretty sure is not going to work. And then you basically use that to show that my thing is great. Yeah. And so you have some people who are basically doing that. And then you have other people who think like, I actually don't think that this other person's thing is really that great. 
And so you compare it with something else and you try to do a study to show that it doesn't work. Okay. But what typically doesn't happen as much is where people take the things that, um, you know, they think might be beneficial and compare it to somebody else's thing that would be beneficial and look at the same outcome measures. And so mm. one of the things that we've been trying to do is, um, you know, the grant we're running kind of, 30,000 people is that we're basically looking at different types of training and we're comparing them directly against each other um, with common outcome measures. And so that we might be able to see like, what are the differences between some of these different methods? The other thing is that we actually recently got a grant that will allow us to share better the outcome measures that we use with other groups. And so we can make it easier for them to use the same outcome measures in their studies. And so even if they're training a different intervention, that we could at least see whether it's giving rise to the same types of effects or different types of effects. And so this kind of maturation of the field mm-hmm. where we recognize the problem, that we move past like kind of the simple, you know, can you see any effect with any measure to like, we need to start coordinating with each other to be able to understand these differences. I think there's some progress there, but I think there's more to be made. Okay. Uh, That's a, that's a really good point. I've I've, I've seen that actually in a lot of different fields now, even, you know, I'm over in chemical engineering, but there seems to be a big push now to sort of do what exactly what you're saying, you know, set up, like set up a a baseline so that everybody's making an apple to apple comparison. Even if you're trying Mm -hmm. to, you know, even if you're coming at it from different ways, you all, you know, you need to be able to say, okay, I can compare what I'm doing to somebody else's work and have it be a valid comparison. So that's that's really cool. Uh, let's see here. So this is kind of for both of you. Um, is there a length of time that seems to optimize the learning? So basically, like, you know, short bursts of training compared with, say, longer sessions. Um, it, it, have you, it, has that been looked at is, or do you have a sense of, like, which one goes with, which one does better or is it kind of another one of the, it depends on the person <laughs> uh, answers. <laughs> yeah, it, it, the, in, the short answer is definitely it depends, right? Mm-hmm. But still, there's some work out there that we have done that others have done. So in generally, if you spend hours and hours each day uh, trying to, to train your working memory, that's not great. Mm-hmm. So typically, we see a little bit of a sweet spot that people can do like 20 minutes or so seems to be like a good um amount of, of really focused training uh, mm-hmm. before you get fatigued and it might not be benefiting as much. You can then maybe take a little break and do another round of 20 minutes. But typically that's about the, the, the amount of training that we say per day is, is probably about good, can be even a little bit less. In terms of time, so how often should we train? Mm-hmm. So should you train for a year or two years or three years? It's probably... After a certain amount, uh, amount of weeks, in, in our experience, there's not very much more that you can gain from just one uh, particular um, intervention. Mm-hmm. Uh, so typically, we see like four weeks or 20 sessions, 30 sessions is probably about right uh, for people to really get to their peak of the performance. Mm-hmm. And then you might want to wait or do something else instead or, or move over to another game or another activity um, to keep also things interesting. So Erin was mentioning that also training variability. So um, mm-hmm. um, training your executive function or working memory skills in different ways is definitely beneficial for you too, uh, because at some after some time you get into a routine. So you do mm-hmm. the same thing over and over again, and then uh, you're doing these things automatically. So that's again, not what you would want if you really want to train with your working memory. So you want to have a constant challenge and challenge your working memory skills in order to benefit. So if you can just sit there, close your eyes and just mindlessly doing this, then it's a sign that it's no longer beneficial for you. But again, there are large individual differences, like how how much time people need to get to this point. But but in general, um, yeah, if it gets more to this your ability to do this mindlessly or while watching TV, Mm -hmm. it's not challenging your executive function skills properly anymore. Okay. 
That's interesting. It sounds it's almost like uh, like like plateaus that people that like lift weights hit, where that you know if if you do the same thing over and over, like you said, you you, you kind of it levels out, and then you have to change it up to, to basically almost trick your body and, and sort of re-engage. That's that's it's really right. cool the mm -hmm. parallels that happen there. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a question here. So this again, kind of for both of you, um, what can you can you talk about a little bit about the controls in the experiment? So is it something? Like business as usual, or an active control that receives rigorous construction, rig rigorous instruction in a variety of content areas. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's a good question. So we have used a variety of uh, active controls, and really depends on the context too. So uh, an ideal control, what we think would be um, uh, an intervention that's believable, so that participants also think they're training something that's useful, mm -hmm. but that does not require working memory and detention skills. Mm -hmm. And given that working memory is so ubiquitous in everything that we do, it's actually not quite simple to come up with an active control that is engaging, that is be mm -hmm. believable, and does not uh, require working memory skills. So one intervention that seems to be working quite well in that regard is what we call a knowledge training or general knowledge vocabulary training, where mm. people do sort of like GRE or SAT type questions. They, they get these uh, working memory, uh, not working memory, vocabulary, general uh, knowledge skills that also become increasingly harder as they go on. They find these really interesting. They find it engaging. Uh, it's also related to memory, but not to, to working memory. Mm -hmm. And that has shown to be a quite, um, um, again, a believable, but also an engaging uh, active control that we have liked quite a bit. But then there are some other instances where um, business as usual control groups can be very beneficial. And as um, Aaron was showing uh, uh, an example where we were interested in the different levels of the, the gamification um, in a so-called parametric design. So we, mm -hmm. we, we, we tried uh, different features in each of these, and we just want to compare this with a, a business as usual control to just see how much more to not doing anything, um, adding this feature um, then um, uh, lead to some of these learning effects. So, so in that, then weightless controls are, are absolutely um, adequate in, in our opinion as well. So again, it really depends what we're, we're trying to get at with our intervention. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have these uh, more sophisticated active controls, sometimes business as usual. Sometimes we have these other visual search type um, active controls. So, so again, it depends. Okay. And then the other thing I might add is sort of like, you know, go to our um, kind of online memory training study and that they're like, every condition is an active condition, mm -hmm. but we expect that different people will each have a best condition. Sure. And so like goes back to this argument I was saying in terms of what does gamification help or hurt? is that there's going to be some people where we'd hypothesize based upon things that we think we could measure that the non-game is going to actually be the best condition for them. There's going to be other people where the game is going to be the best condition. And so like, if you're in the study, you might think that like, well, I'm in the control condition because, you know, I'm not getting the game or, you know, now that I've said this, maybe you're in the control condition because you are getting the game. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's really looking at something different because it's, you know, trying to figure out like across a bunch of different things, all of which could potentially be beneficial. How can we understand the differences of those benefits across different people? Um, and you know, it's, it's a different way of looking at things, but, um, I, I think it's important to think of it that way. Absolutely. Um, is there, has anybody, or I'm sure somebody's looked for it. Is, is there a placebo effect? Like, if, <laughs> it, like if you have, like, if you tell people, all right, we're giving you, you know, that we're, we're going to improve your working memory. This is definitely going to do it. And then you give them one of these that does not actually do that, do, do you see an increase versus telling them some version of like, you're the control group? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is an excellent question. So uh, Aaron and I have also funding from the NIH to look at this precise question. And okay. we have been struggling with this quite a bit because often people argue, eh, well, what you see are just simply placebo effects, precisely as you said. Mm -hmm. So they believe, they train their working memory, they get better at it. But um, when we, we tried these in different ways, um, 
by telling people or in, uh, eliciting certain expectations in people, telling them, oh, if you train on this, you will become better in X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And we had a really hard time to, to seeing that um, just telling people about their expectation uh, and also um, that doesn't seem to really do anything or not over and above the training uh, task itself. So what we're doing right now is also, uh, in addition to just bluntly telling people about these expectations and, and inducing these expectations in different ways, mm -hmm. we also give them feedback. So, so we have them do uh, intermediate tests in which we give them um, slightly different versions of the task that are harder or easier, but also there, it's not as, as simple. So it doesn't seem to be very easy to, to get these placebo effects mm -hmm. in a reliable way which makes us think that um, the effects that we see as a function of uh, working memory training, there might be some placebo effects. There likely are some placebo effects involved as well mm -hmm. with any kind of intervention work. So if you do an intervention and you believe that it doesn't work at all, likely you don't engage in that at all, because why would you if you think it doesn't help? Sure. But if you think it helps, that also helps you to engage with training with motivation. So some aspects of placebo definitely play a role, but our data so far doesn't don't seem to suggest that it's only placebo effects that play a role. Okay. Yeah, and the other complexity is that, like, you know, how do the placebo effects, to the extent that they are there, influence near transfer versus far transfer sure. uh, or the distribution of all the possible outcomes. And that once again, um, it's actually going to be individual differences where you're going mm -hmm. to find that, you know, there are some people where you're going to be more likely to kind of see these effects and mm -hmm. why you see them, you know, I think might be complex. And then also there's a, the other question is like, how, what is the action of the placebo effect? Because, you know, one idea is that they just try hard on the post-test. Mm -hmm. That explains why they do better. And so, like, maybe it's not meaningful. The other thing is that, like, maybe the placebo actually induced a change that is real for the person mm -hmm. that gives rise to a long-lasting benefit. And then, well, okay, great from the public health perspective. Sure. You know, they basically have this gain. And so... We were really, once again, trying to have a very open-minded perspective of, you know, how placebos, you know, might have some complexity and, you know, sometimes are confound and sometimes are actually a benefit. Mm -hmm. okay. And we really are at the perspective, right? If, if we can generate placebo effects in a way that we, is predictable to us, then we can actually use them to make the training even better. So we can use yeah, them to our advantage. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and ask this along the same, sort of along the same lines. Sometime, you know, wh whether it's near future or farther out, do you anticipate, in terms of trying, you know, it seems like based on, on the work you've shown so far, there, there's, there's some, some amount of individualization that's gonna be needed. Do you anticipate that, that you'll basically screen somebody similarly to how you might, for lack of a better analogy, do like an allergy screening? So like you'll, you'll exp, you know, will you, will you be able to expose a person to, you know, 10 different types of training and kind of go, okay, this one didn't work for them. This one did really well for them. You know, this one was okay. So maybe we need to like combine these two. Like is, how do you, how do you envision that, that next step of, of individualizing uh, to a specific person. Yeah, so I mean, this is something where, you know, I, I, there's a couple ways that, like, in my dream, mm -hmm. I like this to happen. Yeah. <laughs> One way is that we ask you a set of questions mm -hmm. and we have you do a set of tests and we could predict what would be the approach that is most likely going to be best for you. Okay. And that type of screening, I think, would be really helpful. And I think that we could explain a certain amount of the variance. Mm -hmm. The other is that when you really start thinking about, like, the differences between a test and a training, mm -hmm. they're pretty close to each other. Because what a training really is doing is that you kind of do something similar to how you would test somebody's working memory. 
Okay. You know, so at each point you're making a measurement and that like we talked about, like if you do well in the two back, we move you to the three back. Mm -hmm. So if you start the training in principle, the training program can start measuring, like, are you improving from this? And that if you're not, it could change the lesson based upon, you know, some expectation of, well, like, if you didn't learn from this, you know, maybe you're more likely to learn from that. And that basically the adaptive methods can do more than just actually um, come up with what's more difficult. They could come up with what do they think is more likely to give rise to a benefit. And actually we have a collaboration with um, Dennis Barber, who's at Washington University in St. Louis, where we're working on these machine learning approaches that um, kind of the current focus of them are actually with our math education goals. We're basically trying to look at measures of executive functions and use them to predict like what might be appropriate um, approach in the classroom for kids to learn math better. But the same algorithms, actually, we have the idea that like, if we're able to measure at a given point, what is um, the challenge that would give rise to the most learning? Mm -hmm. That we could basically have this personalization system that moves both in terms of task difficulty, but also across different training approaches that might have more or less benefit to the person. And so it might take us a few years to get there, mm -hmm. but I'm really excited about the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's very cool. Um, looks like, so this, is, this may be our last question. If anybody in the chat has any more questions they'd like to ask, absolutely, please feel free to do so. Um, this is another good one. Um, uh, what is your opinion about cognitive load theory, uh, which basically that's, that suggests working memory is not trainable, but biologically primary, uh, primary, given its popularity in education at the moment. <laughs> right. So I think this is a big reason why working memory training, cognitive training has been so controversial because it really went against this belief that working memory is something that you're born with, that this fixed capacity like fluid intelligence or, or any of these uh, capacity that we're born with this and that basically that that's, what we, we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But our work and, and, and also the work that looks at um, the role of experiences in, in how um, uh, the role of experiences on cognitive function has clearly shown that working memory is indeed malleable and, and susceptible to a host of different um, uh, environmental impacts in a positive way, but also in the negative way. So one example is if, uh, again, uh, as I was mentioning, if you're stressed, your working memory uh, will will not be as good when you're testing it as opposed to when you're in a good mood and, and um, uh, you, you slept well. So that's when your working memory uh, shows a better performance. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you do these working memory trainings in a targeted way, the way we described it, there's quite a bit of evidence that we can improve working memory skills very specifically so. So in that sense, that really goes against this belief that working memory executive function is, is this unmutable uh, trait. And that's also what we're trying to get at with the project that Aaron was describing before with um, Dennis Barber, in that we really see working memory executive function as something that's not fixed, but something that fluctuates in, in, within, an in, within an individual uh, across days, and that we really... Uh, if we have a good understanding about these fluctuations, we can also use the knowledge on these fluctuations to then strategize uh, interventions um, that build on a each individual's strengths and needs at uh, every moment in time. So that's really the dream that Erin was describing before uh, that we're trying to get at. So we understand uh, what, what each person brings at every moment in time and that we can then from there prescribe interventions, teaching lessons, uh, everything to, to um, lead people to become better learners and, and then feel better. And, and Aaron was mentioning also just generally increase their uh, wellness and um, cognitive health. Yeah, and one thing which I'll add, which I think kind of in some ways kind of makes the idea obvious is that so if you look at cognitive aging, 
what you find is that the trajectories of things like working memory as you age differ tremendously across people. And it's not just true of working memory. It's true of like, you know, essentially, you know, any cognitive skill. And so what you have is those, so let's assume that like you have, you know, these um, different working memory abilities that are fixed across people. That might be at a point in time. As you age, what you find is that people move away from that point in different ways. And so you basically find this massive variability that you have in older adults in terms of working memory that is much greater than what you find in younger adults. Hmm. And then when you start looking at some of these working memory training interventions, there's some evidence that what they do is they reduce the variability so that if all it does is move you back towards where you used to be when you're younger, mm -hmm. it's not going against this cognitive load theory in any way. It's basically saying that you had some propensity for whether it's because of age or maybe you have cancer and you have chemotherapy or maybe you're depressed or there's all sorts of things in life that basically move you away from where you could be that activities that are effective in exercising your skills can move you back towards your propensities. And so these can be very complementary theories. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, especially if you look at kind of trajectories across the lifespan where, you know, I, I think it kind of becomes obvious that, you know, there aren't contradictions um, if you want to hold them both as truths. Interesting. Okay. That's, a, that's a, both great answers. I really appreciate that. Um, it does look like that's all the questions we've got. So uh, if I could get you guys to hang around for just one minute, we'll talk very briefly. Um, but again, thank you both for just absolutely fantastic talk. This is really interesting. It's very cool to learn about and, and see, see actual research. You know, like I said, I, I, I had seen uh, the, like Luminosity, I think it's one of the most popular brain training programs or whatever. I see that pop up all the time. It's nice to actually see people who are, or see the work that's actually going into real, real brain training um, that, that understands that it's not just a magical thing uh, that, you know, uh, that, there, that there's some actual solid work being done. Uh, so this was, a, again, just amazing talk. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I think the audience did as well. Um, thank you to everybody for coming out. Uh, we will be back again next week. Uh, let's see what we've got. Uh, I'm sorry, we actually will not be back next week because next week is Thanksgiving. So we would not next week, uh, the week after that, December 3rd, uh, we have uh, Momoko Ueda uh, from uh, Simon Fraser University. So I'm sure it'll be another great talk. Uh, thank you again to everybody for coming out. Have a good weekend. Uh, get boosted if you need to. Uh, and uh, otherwise, be safe. And hopefully we'll see you out here in two weeks. Um, have a great night, everyone. <laughs>